Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to Grand Rounds. It's uh, really refreshing to see a lot of people in their seats today. Uh, today, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce a triumvirate of presenters, uh, Colleen Baggs and uh, Leanne Gibbs, who are RNs at uh, MGMC Hospice, and Michael Willer, who is a uh, community and family resource uh, coordinator, and they have very, very kindly accepted our invitation today uh, to provide our Grand Rounds presentation, and it is uh, Hospice More Than Dying, and to please join me in welcoming our presenters. Thank you, Dr. Halberg, and welcome. Thanks um, for the great turnout today. Um, my name is Colleen Baggs, and I'm just going to talk real briefly. About a year ago, we did a palliative care um, presentation and talked about palliative care and the difference between that and hospice. And today, we just wanted to um, really talk about that, how we transition from palliative care into hospice describe the services provided by hospice and recognize those benefits um, for the patients, families, and the care providers of hospice care. So we'll be real informal. Please um, ask questions as we go. Um, raise your hand, interrupt, jump up and down. Let us know what you need. So as Dr. Hallberg uh, mentioned, Leanne Gibbs, she's with the Mary Greeley Hospice, and Mike is also with the hospice. Um, and so they'll both share a portion of our presentation today. So just a light overview of palliative care. And from um, CAPSI, which is the Center for Advancing Palliative Care, um, this CAPSI identifies or defines palliative care as a specialized care for people living with a serious illness. And this type of care is focused on providing relief from the symptoms and the stress of, it, of the illness and the goal is to improve the quality of life, not only for um, patients, but also for the families. So there are times when um, it might get brought up in rounds or discharge planning that maybe a palliative um, consult would be needed. And sometimes in, in the ICU, we'll hear, well, they're not quite ready for palliative care yet. And I always just cringe a little bit because when we go into rooms, my way of explaining palliative care to a patient is not to say, well, I'm here to talk to you about hospice. I go in and I say, have you ever heard about palliative care? And I say, really, our goal is just to get to know you and your family better so that we can support you as your medical team might have decisions for you to make coming up in the future. It might be in the next couple of days, might be in the weeks or months coming ahead. So that's really how we introduce um, palliative care. So we see patients that have a chronic and serious illness. There are symptoms that impact their quality of life. We help in identifying what their goals are. Um, we also assist with advanced care planning, pro, um, advanced care planning uh, documents like an advanced directive, a living will, an eye post. And we're just also there just to support patients and families. So in 2000, 13, when the palliative care program started here at Mary Greeley, their goal was to see 200 patients that year. And that year they saw 196, so they got really close. And since 2013, we've been able to grow. Um, in 2023, we saw 947 consults. And a lot of people just think about hospice as focused on for cancer. Um, but you can see our referrals, the second leading cause, or the second leading referral was for cardiovascular. So when Carla asked us to um, present today, I said, can we focus a little bit on heart failure patients? That won't be all of our focus, but I really feel like we catch those patients um, too late in palliative and hospice. Um, oftentimes they've had multiple hospitalizations, um, a variety of things that we're going to um, get into. So, um, so this was barriers to palliative care. In 2016, this was a study that was completed in Germany, and they identified these top barriers to palliative care with um, heart failure patients. And as you can see there, um, heart failure can be really unpredictable. 
You know, we start out here, and when I'm talking with patients and families about heart failure, they think, oh, we just have a little exacerbation and we're going to get back up here. This is their baseline. And really, heart failure, what we see is that they have an exacerbation, they go down, but they never quite get back to that baseline again. And it kind of is this roller coaster, but we never quite reach back there. That fear of destroying hope, so the conversations don't really happen about what their goals are. Um, and the belief that um, uh, palliative care is just for end of life, so not sure how to effectively um, collaborate with us. Those are some of those barriers that were identified there. So goals for goals of care, sometimes we see them as too early or too late. The World Health Organization recommends um, palliative care early in the course of treatment. And one of their signs is if to a physician is, would you be surprised if this patient died in, within a year? And if the answer to that is, no, I wouldn't be surprised, then we should be having those palliative care conversations about what those goals are. So the, this was a study that was um, done in 2014, and it showed that the average time for palliative care referral for heart failure patients to death was 21 days. Less than 10% of those patients with heart failure received palliative care, and less than 12% of patients in the in U.S. hospice admissions are for heart failure. So I think we have some room for growth here. We have some room for improvement in how we manage these patients at the end of the life. Goals of care discussions um, should not really should never happen in a vacuum. And at their best, they are exploratory conversations and they're longitudinal. And at their worst, they occur during a life-threatening crisis and they can feel pressured um, and even adversarial. Sometimes I see that in our ICU when I'm, when I'm asked to go into the ICU and talk with patients. Process for um, complex information, processing all this information that we're throwing at them is best done in the outside of a crisis, so not in the ICU. And really, ideally, these conversations would start at the kitchen table, they continue in the clinic, and they evolve over time. And conceived in this way, discussions about goals of care really should not be limited to goals of end of life. It's really about how they want to live, how they best want to live their life. So triggers in a heart failure patient for end of life communication. If we're seeing someone in the clinic that is having any of these um, identified maybe symptoms, um, we should be asking about palliative care, asking about that goals, goals of care, what they would want. And I'll, to add to this list, I would also add just caregiver fatigue. There are times when caregivers are just burnt out from all of this. So this is Bill. I was able to meet Bill in the ICU in March. Um, and in morning rounds, uh, Bill, I, I heard about Bill. And um, they said, Bill, this is his third hospitalization in six months, and he really needs hospice. So we're going to do a palliative care consult. So during our conversation with Bill, what I discovered was that um, his goal was to attend his granddaughter's wedding in June. So yeah, he wanted to keep coming to the hospital. He wanted to keep having everything done. He also wanted to dance with his wife of 63 years at his granddaughter's wedding. And he had a birthday coming up that the, his family had planned a celebration for. So when I talked with Bill about um, his quality of life, and what he wanted to do, and what his goals were, I said, have you ever heard about hospice? And he, he had, but he said, I'm not there yet because I want to get to my granddaughter's wedding. And after talking with him, we sent him home with an informational meeting for hospice. It wasn't committing to anything. It was just saying, just so you know when you, when you want to call or how they might be helpful to you at home. And so we sent him home with an informational meeting for hospice. And this is where I'm gonna turn it over to Leanne to talk about um, that transition.
I was worried you guys wouldn't see me behind this uh, podium here. <laughs> so I'm Leanne. I'm with Mary Greeley Hospice. And indeed, um, Bill from the ICU got home, and I had been contacted because they wanted an informational visit. Um, so when I go in and do an informational visit, it is, it is strictly that. It can transform into... Um, an admission, you know, if certain criteria is met. But for sure, there is not a commitment to sign up for hospice. Uh, it, it kind of amounts to just a hospice 101. It's a, a real kind of informal meeting. We talk, we get to know each other. They're able to ask questions. We talk a lot about uh, symptoms, if the patient's having that. Uh, life expectancy. I, I put that on this slide because technically speaking in terms of hospice criteria, Medicare is the entity that, that comes forth with this six-month life expectancy parameter. Um, when we sign somebody up for hospice, that's really the one and only time we talk about six months. Um, nobody's got a crystal ball, but what Medicare is thinking is that if this disease process takes its natural course without any extraordinary life-saving measures, this patient, at the professional guess of the physician, has six months or less life expectancy. So that's what an order for hospice indicates. Um, So while we're at that informational visit also, you can see here that there's quite a list of different things that, that I hear when I go out. Um, a lot of people think they know what hospice is. Of course, you go there, you die. It's a place. Um, so we talk a lot about this. We dispel a lot of myths. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen and heard a lot of these, even outside of hospice, maybe even your own um, thoughts about hospice. So we went ahead and looked at the st statistics here at Mary Greeley, and this is from 2023, just last year, on what diagnoses are we seeing in, hos in our hospice admissions. And obviously, like, like Colleen had indicated, uh, cancer is is our biggest diagnosis, and that would be one of the myths is that people think that's what hospice takes care of is people with cancer. Well, as you can see, we take care of other um, types of diagnoses also with cardiovascular being at 14%. You'll see, at least in the physician's packets, I've put a kind of a cardstock piece of paper in there that talks about, uh, it gives indications of what kind of criteria we need for each disease process. So we'll talk about that. Um, also at Mary Greeley, in terms of how we compare to the national average and our length of stay in hospice, we really kind of fall short. Uh, I think there's a lot of reasons why. I don't know if if anybody here has their own personal thoughts on, on what they think. Um, a lot of times I think we're forever hopeful, you know, as caregivers. Um, maybe this is a transient or an acute issue and we're gonna get past this and then we don't. Um, Maybe we think that we're failing them as a care as a caregiver. Um, so, statistically, um, I've I've read it over and over, and I found some um, literature that talked about on average with the same diagnosis. If you had two patients, same diagnosis, same condition, a patient in hospice lives on average twenty nine days longer than the patient without hospice. So that's that's very. Um, revealing to me. 
And I think that all boils down to, not all, but mostly boils down to symptom management. 10% of our hospice patients live two days or less. 25% uh, of our patients live five days or less. And 50% of our patients live 18 days or less. So in my opinion, that's a lot of services and relationships and comfort that, that they could be getting sooner. So as far as admission to hosp hospice goes, technically we need an order. Um, so when we talk about admission to hospice, that can be at home, that can be at a nursing home, that can be at an assisted living. We can do it at our hospice house. We create a plan of care, and that all starts during the admission, and that's with a lot of input from the patient, the family, the caregivers, the friends. We include the pets in the plan of care. Um, when we get together um, as a team, because that's how Medicare looks at hospice, is we are a team, we, are, we collaborate. That's an interdisciplinary team, the IDT, that comprises of these different disciplines. Now, hospice patients have a hospice nurse, they have a social worker, they have a, an attending physician, they have a medical director, sometimes that's the same physician. We also provide um, durable medical equipment to these patients. So there's just a lot of different um, disciplines up there that are involved in hospice care. I think, and even speaking from a personal level and having had family members in hospice myself, intermittent visits with 24-hour access to the team is the biggest benefit to hospice. I'm not going to call 911. I'm not going to call the hospital and have them tell me, have first nurse tell me to call um, 911. Um, People need help, but they don't want to go back to the hospital. And I think that that's a very huge benefit to hospice. Um, and for me, it was the biggest benefit of hospice, as I always knew I had somebody um, that I could call. Hospice doesn't provide care in the home 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Again, it's intermittent. But... In a whip stitch, we can go and visit somebody. We go in the night. We go on the weekend. We go on Christmas. So we're always available 24 hours a day. Um, so then we talk about um, also to the different levels of care. That's This is the last bullet point on here. And I've got another slide that talks about it a little more. Um, when a patient is at home... Um, that that's called routine home care. And then at the hospice house, we have some other levels of care. And like I said, we'll talk about that on a, on a, on a, here on Bill's story. So Bill, the same patient that Colleen saw in the ICU, um, we were able to get him admitted into hospice. He was at home. Um, and while while he was there, we were able to get his symptoms managed. Um, one of the things that I hear a lot, and especially with cardiac patients or maybe COPD patients, um, is we in hospice come in and obviously if these patients are having symptoms, that's, that's a, a main concern usually of them as well as us to get those managed. And again, in the physician's packet, I put a, a list of, it's actually a standing order set that we send to our physicians. Um, and those are the medications that we get at home and we call them a comfort kit. Um, and we teach the family how to use them. This keeps these patients out of the emergency room. And Bill, along with many other patients, said to me, why didn't I have these meds six months ago? Six months ago, prior to the last three hospitalizations that he had had, 
Um, so he went into the hospital numerous times for unmanaged symptoms. So I, I do realize, too, that the medications that we use, morphine and Ativan, aren't something that physicians just hand out freely to. And I know that hospice oversight is um, probably feels good <laughs> for physicians knowing that, that we're there to help manage that. Uh, but we very much teach patients and families how to use these medications. So one of the other parts to his symptom management was one or two times, I'm, I can't remember, he did have a thoracentesis, which is acceptable in hospice. I know a lot of people have thought that maybe that's not the case, um, but we do have patients do thoracentesis if they're short of breath and they're symptomatic. Um, we've had patients get get blood. Maybe it's a one or two time deal because because maybe they have a wedding coming up and they want to have the energy to do that. Um, again, in the when when Bill signed up for hospice, one of the reasons that he told me that he, he was adamant about Mary Greeley Hospice is because we have a hospice facility here in Ames, the Israel Family Hospice House. He wanted respite. He wanted his wife to be able to utilize respite care, which is caregiver relief. And as you remember Colleen saying, when he would go into the clinic and he was at the hospital, the staff saw that his wife was tired. And that's one of the, I think that's something that all of us could really look at is what, what are our caregivers looking like? If they're tired, Maybe the patient isn't, and especially men, maybe, aren't so truthful about how they've declined. But here's this wife that's just shot, you know. And it's probably because she's doing all of his ADLs. She's running back and forth to the fridge, you know, and doing all of that. So he was very adamant about Mary Greeley Hospice because it, was, it, it, provi it would provide his wife respite, um, in a facility that specializes in hospice care. We are also able to utilize respite at, at our nursing homes here in town and, and in our coverage area. But the difference being is that our staff at the hospice house are, are trained hospice care providers. So um, the other thing that was nice is while they were in the hospice house, two different respite stays is that they did get to speak with Mike in regards to bereavement. Um, so then actually after Bill died, um, Bill's wife was already familiar with Mike. So that was just a very smooth transition. We have volunteers also in hospice that in Bill's case, he utilized... Um, I'm at a loss for her name. She does life stories um, out there, Chris. And she'll sit down with these patients and families if they want to be involved and <laughs> kind of do a little biography, you know, um, a life story. And, that, and that's very neat. And he liked that. And also the art club. We collaborate with Ames High. And there's an art teacher up there that does... Uh, this is the second year, I think, that we've done this, um, where she has art students that will come and do portrait drawings off of a photograph. So it teaches these students huge things. You know, it teaches them about hospice. It teaches them about HIPAA. It teaches them about mortality. Um, it's, it, it's a very neat program. Um, then we have Wendy, who's our music therapist, and Bill was into polka music. So we all got to hear that, which is neat, you know. So not only is she at the hospice house to see him, when he goes back home, then she follows him home. So um, we got, I feel like we got good time with Bill. We had him for five months. And so we were able to build relationships with him, um, which at the end of the end of life, I feel is very important. Um, and you know, not 
<laughs> not just for the patients and families, but for us too. So now, Mike will come up and talk about bereavement services. Hi, so I'm Mike. I'm the uh, Community and Family Support Coordinator, and I'm here today because a lot of people, when you think of hospice, think that we're there to take care of the patient. When the patient dies, hospice ends. What I'm here to tell you is that in the case of, like, Bill, um, so when Bill died, we transitioned our focus from Bill to actually Bill's family. So they became, in essence, our, our patients, and we follow them for 13 months after a death. In the case of Bill's wife, um, we put her in for uh, occasional phone calls. We'll just call um, out of the blue and check in, and our question is always, how are you doing, and is there anything we can help you with? Um, in a lot of cases early on, um, they don't know what to say or they say they're doing fine, but as the months go along, suddenly um, they're lonely and they a lot of times just want somebody to talk to. So we'll sit on the phone. Um, I have a nice volunteer that helps me. Uh, the two of us will call families um, every week and we'll just listen. And whatever they want to talk about, we'll talk about with them. If they have questions, we'll try to answer them, but most of the times they just want to process what they're feeling with somebody who um, isn't going to be judgmental and tell them that it's all okay. Um, besides phone calls, we send out um, timed mailings. Um, over the course of that 13 months, families are going to get six mailings from us. Each mailing is different. We include um, suggestions that we think are going to be helpful for a person going through grief about that time frame. Um, besides that, we'll offer uh, support groups throughout the year. It's a six-week um, kind of focused. We work through a book. People are able to come and be part of that group if they want. Um, if they're not uh, comfortable being part of a, a grief support group, but they want follow-up, um, they can come in or I can go out to their house and visit with them one-on-one, -on -one, do short-term grief counseling. Um, if they feel that short-term isn't going to um be helpful, we'll help them try to find a counselor in the area that is um, focused on grief counseling and help them make those uh, arrangements to start to see people. We offer um, two other things, morning coffee. This is a monthly gathering where all we do is provide coffee and a place for people to get together. And it's kind of fun to watch um, families or, or spouses, um, children get together and over a cup of coffee, start to make connections with other people that are going through what they're going through. It gives them the ability to kind of converse and not have to explain a lot of the background on why suddenly they just start crying, but everybody in the room just starts nodding when it happens. And they just continue to drink coffee like nothing's going on. And when the person's done crying and they're able to compose themselves again, not my words, their words, when they're able to compose themselves again, they'll pick up with their conversation and everybody will act like nothing ever happened. And it's great just to have that opportunity once a month to, to have folks be able to be in the same room with each other. And then finally, um, for our families and for our staff, once a year, the first Sunday in October, we offer our Tree of Love Memorial Ceremony, which we hold out at um, IFHH. And every year we plant a tree in memory of the patients we served that previous year. It's the opportunity for us as staff to get together and to um, kind of grieve those patients that we had that we don't anymore. Um, but we uh, invite families to be part of that. And um, the last couple of years, we've been getting 60 to 70 family members that will show up. Um, and amazingly, what we see afterwards is that people will stand in line and take a picture with their tree. Um, and that will be a keepsake for them. So we always make sure that uh, they know that they're welcomed back out at IFHH anytime they want and that their tree will always be there um, and that they can come and just kind of sit around in the grass or take advantage of our gardens out back um, and um, have time that they need. Besides that, um, 
I also want to let you know, um, as um, folks, if you see somebody in a clinic that um, isn't going to go through our hospice organization, but you think they need um, help in bereavement, we do offer these things to the community. As a good neighbor, we just want to be there for others. And so um, it doesn't mean the things that we offer are only for our family and patients, but we do have quite a few people in the community that will be part of our um, grief support groups. Um, we'll have some occasionally drop in for our morning coffee. Um, and then um, I also see some folks that just want to come in and um, have some short-term grief counseling. So I want to let you know that is available to um, people in the community and make sure to take advantage of that. Now, before we get into questions, we want to show you uh, a video from a family perspective of, of their hospice experience. And so I'm going to show you this short video. To be honest, I didn't know a whole lot about hospice until uh, we got to the end of treatment. Uh, my dad was uh, given uh, the... Um, I guess the final notification that uh, there wasn't much that could be done for his treatment. And, uh, and so the oncologist and the nursing staff at the hospital explained to him a little bit about our hospice services. And then the hospice nurses came over and gave him some additional information about those services that they provide. It was a, uh, an eye opening uh, thing for both myself uh, as well as my father. Uh, it gave him an option that uh, he didn't even know was available, and it sounded like something that uh, would benefit us all. I think the biggest benefit of hospice services, really, it comes down to uh, allowing the family members who have been taking care of the uh, of their father, um, in my case, uh, or anyone who is in their family, and allowing them to go from 24-hour caregiver uh, back to being their son, their daughter, their friend, whatever it might be. It, uh, it allowed that weight of um, having to give medications and, and uh, all the things that come along with uh, those, uh, those final stages uh, of taking care of your loved one and making sure that it... Uh, that you get a chance to uh, be a part of their process without having to uh, go through the, uh, the caregiver portion of that. One thing that I would say about uh, the hospice services that were provided uh, is that I don't know that, uh, that there is a more caring group of people uh, in uh, in exactly what they do. Uh, it seemed like every person that we met with from the nurses to the social workers uh, to, um, to when we got into the hospice, those nurses there, uh, the level of care was uh, incredible. Uh, it was the, um, it was just the little things that they did uh, holding his hand, making sure that uh, uh, that they knew that he was a veteran and thanking him for his service. Uh, the the level of um, of information that they shared amongst each other so we didn't have to uh, reinvent the wheel each time was incredible. And I, I'm not sure that uh, they get enough uh, attention or uh, appreciation for their services. It really was uh, an incredible um, gift to us as uh, as we got the opportunity then to uh, to be with my dad uh, in his final moments. So we'll open it up to the floor. Any questions that we can answer for you? Maybe before we um, just take questions, there were, we had a little technical problems. There were a few slides that we thought we had put in but didn't show up. So Leanne just has a couple things to just clarify for us. Yeah, I told you guys I was gonna talk about level of care and then I didn't. 
Um, so this, this also arises, I think one of the myths that pe- I, I didn't know it was a myth till I really got to reading a lot about this is I, I hear that people think that hospice is expensive. So I looked into that a little bit more. Um, when we have a patient who has Medicare and most commercial insurances, you know, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, all of that, um, we have in hospice, um, Mary Greeley Hospice, what we do is three different levels of care. And of course, it's going to depend on where you're at. So if we just talk about the hospice house, we have, of course, you guys heard me talking about respite care. So that's break for the caregiver. So most commercial insurances and definitely Medicare will pay for five days of intermittent respite. And that just sounds, you know, what's that mean? So what that means is somebody can come to the hospice house from home to give their caregiver a break for up to five nights. Now, if they're only there for four and go home, fine. Um, But Medicare is going to pay for that. Uh, Three days later, say, for instance, Bill's wife got the flu, couldn't take care of him. She needed a break to be able to recoup. He could come back to the hospice house for five days of respite. So that's what I mean by intermittent um, periods of respite. We have routine home care hospice, and that sounds kind of weird when you're thinking about the hospice house, but it's routine care. So say, for instance, Bill came in for respite. He'd been there for five days. It was time for him to go home, but he decided he didn't want to. He could stay, but he would be responsible for room and board. And room and board at our hospice facility is $350 a day. Now, our room and board has been $350 a day for quite some time. Um, And now... In the community, I'm hearing of some nursing homes that are more have a higher daily rate than that, which that just is very surprising to me. Um, so that would be routine. Routine would be the patient maybe that has exhausted his or her respite benefit for that stay. Um, their symptoms are managed, um, essentially need a place to stay. Then our third level of care would be acute care or general inpatient level of care, that would be for a patient that has symptoms that are not able to be managed in their current home setting. So we bring them in. Say, for instance, they're having pain, and we've tried that comfort kit and used it to its potential, Um, pulled all of our tricks out of our bag and just aren't getting a good handle on it. So we can bring them to the hospice house. Again, um, Medicare and or commercial insurance pay for that level of care. That level of care is usually very short um, because frankly, we do a really good job at uh, managing symptoms. So those are the three levels of care. Um, When we have people at home, they're, they're under routine home care level of care. So Medicare pays for the staff to come in. It pays for any medications that are related to their terminal diagnosis. It pays for that DME that I talked about, pays for Wendy to come and do polka music. Um, so all of our dis- different disciplines, our DME, our meds. So hospice in a lot of ways, my grandpa was one of these personal hospice experiences that I had. And my grandpa would always say, what's the catch? That it was such a good um, financial situation for him to have hospice. Um, You know, take, for instance, fentanyl patches and what they cost. We sign them up for hospice, their hospice Medicare benefit or their um, private insurance hospice benefit pays for that fentanyl. So it can be a huge savings. The other thing that I want to say also too, because of the foundation that we have here at Mary Greeley, we don't turn patients down. If they don't have any insurance, we do not turn patients down. I did work um, for a hospice prior to Mary Greeley Hospice. 
almost 25 years ago, and we did have to turn people down. We were a small county hospice, and that still happens. If hospices don't have the the money to do it, then um, they don't take those patients. So that's levels of care. Um, and I think it kind of dispels the myth also of hospice being expensive. So... Questions that you guys have. Colleen, do you see um, patients uh, outside of the hospital um, as appointments? Um, so the question that Michelle asked is if palliative care sees patients outside of the hospital. And we do um, outpatient visits, um, not in the sense that we go to their home, but we might catch them if they're in the clinic seeing somebody or if they're in the Cancer Resource Center. Um, we do a lot of phone calls um, to them at home um, and family members to really kind of sort out what the what the greatest needs are at that time. So, could you repeat what that what the third level was again? You said routine care, respite, intermediate respite, or inter intermittent respite mm -hmm. care. What was the third one again? Acute level of care, oh, yeah. or sometimes you'll see it termed general inpatient level, GIP. Yep. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's for symptom management. That's for symptoms and issues that can't be managed at home. Yep. And you know what? We get them managed, and then most of the time they go back home. I think one of the biggest things that we want you to go away from this presentation is, is that if you're not sure if hospice is appropriate, informational hospice meetings happen all the time and are, are, it's very easy to do, um, contacting the hospice agency. Other questions? Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to ask you guys a question, then. I'm going to go back here to, a, to this slide here, the days on hospice. So you see Mary Greeley there in the orange, where our average is 33 days, and the national average is 90 days. And we, we heard um, Leanne talk about the hospice benefit is for, you know, a terminal diagnosis that they would, life expectancy within six months. Why do you think... That Mary Greeley is at 33 days. Days, yeah. I know most of the faces in here. I can call on you. No. <laughs> uh, I think it's clear that we are probably too late in making that referral to hospice. Uh, I mean, I, I know personally that the hospice nurses would do quite a good job of taking care of patients. So it's not like, you know, the care that they provide is, you know, inadequate and so patients are dying you know, sooner, I think that we're probably not making the referrals to hospice in the, in the most timely fashion. So what are those obstacles of getting timely referrals? Education. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. Community education, physician education. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's starting those conversations about how they want to live their life what's important to them. Oftentimes when I'm uh, talking with a patient, we'll talk about, and in Bill's case, you know, are the hospitalizations and his trips to the clinics, are they more of a burden than a benefit? You know, the third hospitalization, he's like, yeah, I can see where this, I'm not really getting the benefit. My hospitalizations are becoming more frequent and there's less time between them. So burden over benefit is something I talk a lot about with patients and families. Yeah. Could that be also affected by like a location where a college town, some people aren't getting quality health care, something prior to this point? Like, would that be impactful on this as well? Or not really? I, I'm not sure. That's a good question. Um, I mean, in the rural areas where they're, they may be getting diagnosed later with their stage four cancer. Lower or, income or something. Yeah, I'm not sure. You know, um, 
There is also a page in the physician packet that talks about um, when should you start having those conversations with your patients about hot, not necessarily hospice, but you know, what do you want to do? Um, do you, you know, what's your code status? Do you want rehospitalized? Those kind of things. Um, on the very bottom of that page, I did put how to make a hospice referral or admission order. Um, so I put the phone number on there. So any of you can call us anytime, even if it's two o'clock in the morning and you work in the emergency room. You can call us. Um, and then also, too, within EPIC, there is a um, REF, R-E-F 35, which is how you put the order in, and it's just quick and easy. As far as, you know, I know a lot of nurses, I think about the nurses in the clinic that see these patients coming in and out and in and out, and they're tired and they don't know if this is the way they want to keep spending their energy. It's okay to to direct them towards a hospice, you know, hospice in general, because again, it's the patient's choice which hospice they go with. Um, but we don't have to have an order or anything. I go out and do referrals because somebody's daughter calls me. I go out and do referrals because a nurse has called me and said, this patient wants to talk to you. So in one of those slides where I put there's no commitment, there's really no commitment. It's strictly informational. And those are probably my favorite meetings. I like informational meetings better than I like referrals and admissions. <laughs> I love informational meetings. Um, for those physicians who are online, I'm going to take some of these packets if we, and um, just yeah. let them know. We'll have some in the physician lounge. That's a kind of a centralized location. Awesome. Take some to the hospitalist office and also the ED. So yeah. um, I know there's several online, so hit one of those three locations to grab a packet. Right, right. I know I've heard um, there's times that we haven't been called because people didn't know they could call us in the night mm -hmm. here at the hospital, like in the ED. And that's nobody's fault, probably except our own, that we need to just say, hey, call us anytime, because really we mean it. Yep. And for case, case managers that are here on the weekends, um, yep. you know, you can feel free to call. Um, and it's just calling the hospice house and they'll get in touch with the person that's on call. Yep. Great. Kelly had something. Do you want to touch a little bit on that patient that comes that maybe isn't the most appropriate to admit and how we can come and do an informational? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so definitely sometimes we go out and see patients that don't meet hosp hosp hospice criteria as that cardstock piece of paper talks about. Um, but I think those are golden because here we've made contact with a patient, I said the other day, Wes, that you're really a good advocate from the home side because I've talked to physical therapist Wes how many times about different hospice patients and like how cool is that, you know, um, that we've, we've established some sort of contact there and then, you know, if they don't meet criteria at that particular moment, I tell them what criteria looks like. And then usually I, I put them on a list where I follow up with them again, you know, in a couple weeks or in a month or whatever, but they can always call. So I provide them with that. And I usually leave them with some sort of literature so that they can get a hold of us. Those are golden, you know. I hear people apologizing for wasting my time. I'm like, oh boy, no. Those are golden. Yeah. 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 Uh, just going further on that point, um, I think oftentimes the discussion about hospice is not happening when it should start. Um, that a lot of times patients have emotional processing that they have to go through mm -hmm. in order to come to an agreement that hospice is appropriate. 
Um, and I think probably when we're talking about oncology types of issues, we're having that exposure to palliative and to hospice kind of early on in, in terms of the treatment. I don't know that we do the best job when it comes to other chronic illnesses like yeah. CHF, COPD, that kind of thing. Right. Right. I agree. And a lot of times it's very insidious, you know. Or maybe he had a, an exacerbation. Remember that exacerbation he had three months ago? It looked just like this. And by golly, he pulled out because he always does. I mean, I can see how it happens. But it kind of boils down to how do you want to spend your energy? Um, back and forth. I had a patient tell me one time, Repeated hospitalizations, in and out, in and out. And he says, you know, it's, it's this baseline that Colleen talks about. Every time I go to the hospital, I leave a little bit of me there. I never get my full self back. And I'm just like, that's perfect. That's the perfect way to say that. And it's true. Yeah. Any other questions? This is just a comment, but I think recently I'm really happy with how at the hospice house we've been doing the ER to direct admit to the hospice. Yes. I mean, I just feel like that is such a great collaborative effort on yeah. um, improving the patient and family experience. They don't have to go through a whole hospital admission to the next day be brought out to the hospice yeah. house. And I yeah. just really like to give kudos to all the teams on that. Yeah. And sometimes we get stuck in, well, they're not um, appropriate criteria for the hospice house. But what we've learned is that sometimes the hospice house can be a bridge for us, especially when they're coming from the ED and they want to get home and it's 3.30 and how do we do that? And we have some symptoms we got to get under control yep. before we get home. So the hospice house has been great to say, let's come out for a couple days. Let's get things under control and then get you home. Yeah. yeah. Versus saying, well, you don't meet criteria for the house, so that's not an option. Or if they're in the, um, in the hospital, they don't meet criteria for the, for the house. Um, just last week we did this where yeah. we sent a patient to the house with an anticipation of going home on Monday. You know. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time. Oh, we have three questions online. Oh, Ooh. great. Where do we see First those questions. at? Oh, I'll just read them. Okay. <laughs> All right. The first question is, where does the Iowa legislature stand on death with dignity? <laughs> um. Hmm. I don't know if I can answer that directly, um, but I know that Iowa does not permit any um, youth, any assistance with assisted death. I don't know if there's anything more to say about that. At this time, Iowa is not. I think there's like five states that do. Um, mm -hmm. Anything else to add? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is a bill in the legislature for 2024 um, that is asking for that too as well right now. So. so Eric is saying in the back, if you couldn't hear that, that there is a bill uh, set in the legislature or up for for vote. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's what it, mm. I did a quick Google search. That there is, there is a bill asking yeah, for that for the state of Iowa. It's called Our Care, Our Options Act. Our Care, Our Options Act. That'll be interesting. Hmm. Okay, the second question asked if we know of any local advocates for death with dignity laws. Hmm. I don't. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to pull it out of the top of my head because we are contacted by um, an organization um, probably about a year ago to work with them in, it was something, um, I'm not going to pull, be able to pull their name out, but we were contacted about a year ago to work with them on a presentation for the community, and it had it was very much towards the death with dignity. Um, but I can find find that out and get back to you on what that organization is. Okay, and the last question is: How is GMC's diagnoses distribution compared to the national data? It it's very comparable. Yeah, Can cancer, uh, and then up 
Second is cardiovascular. We see that nationally too. Well, thank you. We appreciate your time today.